Good evening, everybody. Welcome. Uh, I'm Gabriel Rosenfeld, the new president here at the Center for Jewish History, and it's my pleasure uh, to be able to help kick off the new CJH exhibition, How Jews Became Citizens, with our panel discussion. Um, tonight's event is intrinsically interesting for all kinds of historical reasons, but it's especially meaningful to me as it brings me back nostalgically to my college years. Um, David Sorkin remembers that I was a, a student in his history of anti-Semitism class at Brown University in the spring semester of 1986, and Marsha Rosenblatt wouldn't know it, but around the same time I wrote a paper on her important book, The Jews of Vienna, 1867 to 1914 in my Jewish sociology class taught by Calvin Goldscheider. I hope David and Marcia don't mind that I'm dating myself and by extension them as well in my nostalgic musings this evening, but I'm happy to welcome them to the center. Of course, I'm also happy to welcome my distinguished younger colleagues, Daniel Schwartz and Ivy Weinberg, whose youth should not be held against them, to paraphrase a famous line from a former United States president. Uh, my main task this evening, however, is to introduce Ivy, who will be um, moderating our discussion and who is, more importantly, the curator of the exhibit, How Jews Became Citizens. She is an independent curator and founder of Independent Museum Works, which creates exhibitions for American museums, institutions of higher education, documentary filmmakers, and corporations. In applying her wealth of experience to curating How Jews Became Citizens, Ivy has succeeded brilliantly in allowing Sid Lapidus' collection to bridge the gap between the 17th century and the 21st century and remind us of the timeless importance of civil rights. I hope everyone who is online, who hasn't yet come to the exhibit, I hope you can all come by the center and see it in person. It's a marvelous exhibition. Um, and I would also like to uh, announce that there will be three supplemental lectures that will be delivered starting in January. We're going to have um, Professors Ben Nathans, Lila Corwin Berman, and Justin Marlin giving talks on Jewish emancipation in other contexts, each in Europe, the United States, um, and uh, the Sephardic world. And so um, this is an ongoing endeavor uh, to talk about a topic of great timely significance. So I will turn the floor over to Ivy, or at least I will turn the chair over to Ivy, and welcome everybody. Thank you, Gavin, and welcome to everyone here at the center and joining us online on Zoom. Uh, my name is Ivy Weingram, and I curated How Jews Became Citizens, highlights from the Sid Lapidus collection, along with my uh, esteemed colleagues who are here today. We're each going to give introductions um, and about ourselves. You don't have to introduce somebody else. Um, uh, and then we'll get started with our conversation. So to my immediate right, Daniel Schwartz. Um, thank you, Ivy. Uh, yes, I'm Daniel Schwartz. I'm a professor of Jewish history uh, at George Washington University in Washington, D.C. Um, I focus primarily on modern Jewish intellectual and cultural history. I'm interested, broadly speaking, in kind of like the role that words, images, ideas have played um, in how Jews have understood uh, their modernity and their place in the world. So whether kind of writing about the reception of Spinoza or the history of the word ghetto, these are various avenues that I've taken to explore that issue. And Marsha Rosenblatt. Hello, I'm Marsha Rosenblatt. I'm a professor, I'm the Harvey M. Meyerhoff professor, he would be upset if I didn't say so, um, of Jewish history at the University of Maryland in College Park. I'm a social historian um, of the Jews in 19th and early 20th century Central Europe, primarily in what was once called the Habsburg monarchy, um, Austria-Hungary, uh, particularly its German-speaking Jews um, in Vienna, but also in Bohemian Moravia, what's now the Czech Republic, and in Chernovitz in the East, in Bukovina. Um, and uh, I've written on the Jews of Vienna. I've written on the Jews of Habsburg, Austria during World War I. I have written some articles on the Jews of Moravia, which is the Eastern part of the Czech Republic today. <clears throat> and I've, uh, I'm now working on a, on a study of former Habsburg Jews who left if they were lucky, in 38, 39, 40, 41, and came to the United States or Great Britain or British Mandate Palestine and try to make new lives for themselves and the extent to which they did or did not succeed. And last but never least, David Sorkin. 
Uh, hi, my name is David Sorkin. I'm the Lucy G. Moses Professor of um, Jewish History at Yale University. Uh, I started out um, as a cultural and intellectual historian of German Jewry, writing about the uh, period from the mid 18th century to the mid 19th century. Um, I also wrote a sh short book on uh, Moses Mendelssohn's Jewish thought uh, and a book on um, comparative religious history in the 18th century, comparing Protestant, Catholic, and Jewish thought, called, which I call the Religious Enlightenment. Uh, I then shifted to political history and published a book a few years ago uh, called Jewish Emancipation, a history across five centuries. And I'm now working on a book on what I call emancipation politics. Thank you. So um, I'll provide a little bit of background on the exhibit around which this program and the others that Gob mentioned are organized. So we have a special exhibition open now at the Center for Jewish History open through February 28th that features a number of books donated by longtime center supporter and supporter of the American <clears throat> Jewish Historical Society, Sid Lapidus, who has collected uh, uh, over uh, and donated over 130 books to the Center for Jewish History on European Jewish emancipation. And so we've organized a special exhibition that takes a geographic approach to telling this story from around the 17th through the 19th centuries, mostly in Western Europe. And um, these, what you'll find in these books when you come to see the exhibit at the center is that um, they really reveal conversations among Jewish and Gentile leaders and thinkers who are negotiating the terms of Jewish emancipation across centuries. And we're talking here about issues of settlement and naturalization, economic and you know, commercial rights, and also civil rights. And um, to, to really, I think, kick things off, I'd, I'd like to start by asking David Sorkin, who was our lead historian on the project, to define our terms. What do, we, what do we mean when we talk about emancipation? Um, what did it mean to the societies that were granting it? And what did it mean to the Jews who were experiencing it or not experiencing it? Okay, thanks, Ivy. Um, I, I think for an American audience, when we use the term emancipation, we immediately think about the emancipation of slaves. Um, you might also think about the emancipation of workers or the emancipation of women. Uh, in, 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 the context we're talking about here, uh, we're using emancipation actually in regard to the adherence of different religions. In Europe, after the Reformation, um, at, um, European societies were multi-religious societies and minority religions usually had inferior, an inferior political status. So if you think about England, for example, the, the established religion was Anglicanism, but non-Anglican Protestants had, inferior, had an inferior political status. Catholics had an inferior political status. And when Jews were readmitted to England beginning in 1655-56, the question was, well, what would their status be? And of course, it was an inferior status as well. Uh, and this was true across the continent. Uh, Catholics and Protestant countries had an inferior status. Protestants and Catholic countries had an inferior status. And as in England, um, non-conforming Protestants, Lutherans would have an inferior status in a Calvinist country or Calvinists in a Lutheran country. So Jewish emancipation is really about the process by which all those members of all of those relig minority religions, as it were, who had inferior statuses were gradually released from that, that inferior status and made equal. And this is part of the larger creation of citizenship in Europe. So maybe we can um, jump off from there with uh, a discussion of how uh, in, in broad strokes, the emancipation of Jews played out across the continent. And David, I'll go back to you to kick us off 
um, talking about uh, England and British Jews, and then we'll move um, uh, back this way to Marcia and Daniel, and we'll, we'll talk about Jewish emancipation in other regions. Okay, so I'll, I'll just start uh, with the example of England. England was um, a slightly unusual example uh, because when Jews were readmitted in the mid 17th century, they weren't granted uh, a charter or a specified legal status, which, was, which had usually been the case on the continent. Um, they were allowed in on an ad hoc basis. And so their legal status was unclear. There were still laws on the books from, before, from when Jews had lived in England in the Middle Ages before the expulsion in 1290. Um, so th they, they, they arrived in, in, into a, a, a situation which one, which the historian Todd Endelman has called a statutory vacuum. It was unclear what their legal status would be. Uh, and it had to be tested on an ad hoc basis. But basically what happened is they had th the same status as non-conforming Protestants. The first purpose-built synagogue in London, for example, Bevis Marks, looks exactly like a Quaker meeting house. It isn't on a public avenue, it was on a lane, so, which also was a marker of its inferior status. So on, it, it, on, an, on this ad hoc basis, Jews gradually acquired um, a set of civil rights. They, um, through court case, they, they were allowed freedom of residence, freedom of occupation in most cases, um, freedom of worship and freedom of conscience. And then gradually um, um, juridical standing, <coughs> excuse me, where Jews could uh, bring suits in court, but also serve as witnesses. Uh, and they wouldn't be called on, on the Sabbath to testify in court. Um, so by the, by, the early, by the early 19th century, they really had the full, a full set of civil rights, but not political rights. Uh, and dissenting Protestants also gained, began to gain political rights uh, in, in the beginning, uh, in early in the 19th century, and then Catholics gained emancipation, and the term was used Catholic emancipation in 1829 which left Jews as the only non-Anglican group or dissenting group not to have political rights. <laughs> and Jews then gradually gained political rights, which meant both the ability to hold office or offices of trust as they were called and um, to hold elected office. So you find Moses Montefiore, for example, being appointed a sheriff in the city of London. Uh, and of course, when he traveled to the when he traveled around the world on behalf of Jews as sort of the great Jewish intercessor, he wore his uni his red uniform of a sheriff with gold epaulets, and of course, it was all all very impressive because Montefiore was six foot three, you know, and he also had a sword. Um, so Jews gradually gained the right to gradually gained various rights in 1833. For example, the first Jew was admitted to the bar, Isaac Goldsmith. Um, and then eventually Jew, the first Jew was allowed to take a seat in parliament. Uh, it was a Rothschild. He had to be reelected five times before he was allowed to take his seat because there was an oath that you had to take to sit in parliament, which included the phrase on the true faith of a Christian. Well. He would go and stand and, and go to parliament and then refuse to take the oath and then he couldn't be seated. So finally, uh, the House of Commons uh, introduced a new oath um, where instead of saying, um, uh, um, you said, I, I, um, you said on the true faith of a Christian, you said, said um, it, uh, in God I trust or something like that, something neutral that he, that he could say. And also he could swear on an Old Testament rather than a New Testament. He was able to take his seat. And eventually then, that was 1858 and 1881, he was also then, he also became a peer uh, 
and was admitted to the House of Lords. Uh, Marcia, do you want to tell us a little bit about how this played out in the German states and Austria? Right. See, it feels funny to skip France. Are you talking about well, France? Uh, oh, okay. We can do France next if you No, like. no, no, I'm happy to talk about, uh, um, <laughs> although chronologically, you know, France goes first, right? Because the Jews there were emancipated in 1791 by the 1790 and 1791 by the French Revolution. But the German states and Austria, I was going to talk also about Austria-Hungary. Uh, well, it wasn't called Austria-Hungary yet, but the Austrian Empire. Um, uh, it's a very different situation than England, because in England there was, um, as Todd Edwards himself says, a more liberal society that allowed you certain numbers of civil rights. Um, in the various German states, and there were hundreds, 300 of them before um, the 19th century, um, the, the status of the Jews varied, of course, from state to state, but overall, um, in the late 18th and early 19th century, in all of the German states and in the Austrian yeah. Empire, for that matter, um, the Jews were very restricted. Um, they were restricted economically in terms of what they could do to earn a living. They were restricted resident. They were, thank you, sorry. Uh, they were restricted um, uh, economically in terms of where they could, uh, what they could do to earn a living. They were restricted residentially in terms of where they could live. Um, mostly not ghettoized. Some places had ghettos in the German states. Frankfurt had a ghetto and there were a few other ghettos, but it wasn't that they had to live in ghettos, but they were not allowed to live in many places. Most cities still had the right of not tolerating Jews and they didn't tolerate Jews. Of course, that's one of those things. When they didn't tolerate Jews, they still had Jews, right? Um, Vienna, for example, did not tolerate Jews till 1848. But at the time of the revolution of 1848, there were probably 4,000 Jews in Vienna um, because they, very wealthy Jews could purchase the right to uh, be tolerated. Uh, and, uh, and they were allowed to live there with their wives and their uh, children and their servants and their employees and their hangers on and, and so forth. So there were more Jews uh, than, uh, than, the, than the zero that the law stipulated. But in any case, um, so they were restricted in terms of where they could live. They were restricted in terms of how many of them could marry in any given year. They were very draconian marriage restrictions in some German states. Bavaria had marriage restrictions. Um, Bohemia and Moravia had the most draconian marriage restrictions in Europe. Um, and of course, they had no political rights and uh, they paid onerous taxes and, you know, the situation was fairly fairly restricted. Now, in the course of the 19th century, things changed for a variety of reasons. Um, for economic reasons, many economic restrictions were lifted. Um, there were the revolution of 1848 got rid, of, well, it actually emancipated the Jews, but that was rescinded when the revolutions failed. But, um, but some of the old restrictions went by the wayside. Right when um, the uh, economic restrictions mostly went by the wayside, the residential ones too. Um, Jews after, in Austria-Hungary, they had freedom of movement. They could live any place after 1848, even though they no longer had the political rights that they had for about a year and a half during the revolution. Of course, some things had, it's, it's all so complicated, right? It all, it's always more complicated. We're saying, yeah. yeah. Um, but in, in Austria, the Austrian Emperor Joseph II had ended many of the economic restrictions already in, the, in, the, in 1781, 82, 83, 85, 89, whatever. Um, so, um, so restrictions were ended, but, but really emancipation in the full political sense of including the Jews in, as citizens and equal under the law um, really occurred with the triumph of liberalism as a political movement um, in the German states um, and in Austria in the 1860s, really. Um, so that the Austrian Empire in, in Austria and in Hungary in 1867, the Jews were emancipated. And in the, in the unified Germany that came into existence in 1870-71, Jews were also emancipated. They, they'd been emancipated in parts of Germany before that. Um, Prussia had emancipated its Jews in 1812, but only a third of them, not all of them. Um, and uh, some smaller German states like Baden had emancipated the Jews earlier as well. But basically um, the liberal political movement which sought democratic representative government and equality 
um, for all and uh, so forth as part of its agenda was Jewish emancipation. And so Jews were granted emancipation um, every place, uh, not every place in, in the world, but in, in, uh, in all of, in Germany and in Austria-Hungary in that period. So let's jump back a little bit to the beginning of the 19th century and talk about what happened in France. Yeah, right. Right. Um, well, in terms of trying to differentiate the French experience um, from the two previously discussed, um, you know, the Anglo experience and let's say more Germanic experience for all their differences, they were both essentially kind of like protracted processes. Uh, that you know, kind of developed over a period of time or in a kind of evolutionary way. Uh, whereas in the French case, uh, emancipation essentially came through revolution. Um, uh, you know, over the course of 1790 to 1791, the Jews who lived in France received essentially, I mean, uh, full equality. Uh, and you know, I mean, the French case is often seen as a kind of like, I mean, in the past has been seen as like a kind of paradigmatic case of talking about emancipation. Um, in the National Assembly, uh, in December 1789, there was a famous debate over uh, whether Jews should be granted citizenship, uh, which ended in a stalemate. Uh, but the main proponent of granting Jews citizenship uh, was a, a man named Count de Stanislas de clermont tonnerre uh, And he famously said during this debate, uh, the Jews should be denied everything as a nation, but granted everything as individuals. Um, which essentially was to say uh, that um, there was a kind of quid pro quo for citizenship. Uh, there was a kind of like contract of emancipation that Jews would gain rights as individuals uh, in a kind of immediate relationship to the state. Uh, but in order to obtain that, they would have to forego their traditional communal autonomy and self-government, any kind of corporate privileges they might, might once have had. Um, so, you know, when I teach modern Jewish history, I often tell my students, like, if you remember one quote from this class, you know, remember this one, because it really does kind of set a certain framework uh, you know, for thinking about uh, emancipation. Um, now, you know, if we kind of burrow a little bit deeper, um, there are certain idiosyncrasies of the French case that do kind of uh, map a little bit more onto what was already discussed. So uh, in France, circa 1789, this is a very small, you know, Jewish population. Uh, it's about 40,000. Um, the original Jews uh, to have at least resettled France, since Jews were expelled from France in, in the 14th century. Um, these were Sephardic Jews who lived in the Southwest, you know, primarily in port cities like, ah, okay, like Bordeaux. Uh, and they originally had been invited to resettle as kind of new Christians, uh, as Muranos or Prendersos. Um, and even though for the most part, you know, um, the government turned a kind of blind eye to evidence of Judaizing in the community. Nevertheless, they were not allowed to come op out openly legally as Jews until 1723 when they had originally settled in the 16th century. Uh, but from the start, they had, you know, considerable range of what we might call a civil right. So it wouldn't have been framed then as, as such. I mean, it was freedom of occupation, freedom of residence. Um, and you know, over the course of the 16th, 18th century, this is a population, uh, first of all, it's a much smaller population than the Ashkenazi population, it's only about like 5,000 Jews, maybe even less. Um, but they became fairly acculturated uh, to, you know, French culture. Uh, and so, you know, we would say that kind of entering into the revolution, they already had, you know, a, a, you know, a fairly substantial bundle of what we might consider civil rights. Um, so then there was another jury, the, the larger of the two juries, about 30 to 35,000 Jews who lived in the Northeast uh, in areas like Alsace and Lorraine and the city of Metz. Uh, and 
this was a jury that was much more similar uh, to what Marsha was describing in that it was a, you know, it was a Jewish community uh, that uh, still was uh, lived under much greater restrictions in terms of residence, in terms of occupation, uh, limited to kind of a few, concentrated in a few key fields, um, certain kind of taxation um, that differentiated them, and also just a more com traditional community, uh, much less acculturated, um, even as, you know, France, over the course of the 18th century, begins to try to, like, you know, kind of um, encroach on Jewish communal uh, self-government, but they still have, you know, a fairly substantial measure of it uh, for most of the time. So this was a community that basically didn't have civil rights and didn't have political rights. Uh, whereas we could say, you know, for the Sephardic Jews of the, of the Southwest, uh, that they had kind of civil rights without political rights. Um, so emancipation in France essentially takes place in two acts. Um, I mentioned this debate in the National Assembly in December of 1789. So uh, a lot of the protests came from delegates uh, from Alsace uh, where frictions between Jews and Christians were much greater. Uh, Jews were often money lenders in this region, which only added like, to the tension. Um, and so they kind of like deferred dealing with the Ashkenazi case in the Northeast and basically said, came to a kind of resolution with regard to the Sephardim of the Southwest, as well as a small population of Jews who lived in Avignon uh, and kind of traced their uh, place there back to when the papacy was in charge of Avignon. Um, so what happened is basically the, the legislation that granted them uh, emancipation uh, basically kind of essentially confirmed them in the, in the civil rights they'd enjoyed to that point while kind of like adding this idea of active citizenship, which kind of translates into like political rights. Uh, so you know, here it was, you know, it was not, you know, quite as um, all, all embracing a package uh, as what would be offered to the Ashkenazi Jews of the, of the Northeast uh, roughly 20 month, 21 months later uh, in September of 1791, by which point the National Assembly had agreed upon a constitution and then they felt, well, we have to figure out the Jewish issue. Uh, and so what they did was they granted um, all the Jews of France, focusing on the Ashkenazi Jews of the Northeast, you know, the full extent of civil and political equality. Uh, so this was really a rupture. Um, you know, if we think about the earlier cases of more protracted, more piecemeal, here was like, you know, a fairly abrupt change overnight in terms of the legal status uh, of, the, of the Ashkenazi Jews of France. Now, I mean, the drama doesn't quite end. Um, maybe I'll leave it off, you know, for questions and answers if it's later episode with Napoleon and the Jews where the issue of emancipation essentially is revisited. Um, and certain uh, strings are even attached for a period. Uh, but I think, you know, just as a, in, a, in a nutshell, I hope <laughs> that that's the case of the Jews of France. Can I add something, um, not about what happened in Germany or in Austria in terms of political developments, but in terms of the quid pro quo mm -hmm. issue, because I'm really glad you raised that. It's a very important issue. In France, it was very clear that the Jews would be emancipated, but they were expected to become French, whatever that meant, because nobody was sure really at that point what being French meant. Um, and it was sort of the opposite in Central Europe. That is, they didn't get emancipation, but they were expected to Germanize um, in the German states and even in the Austrian Empire in that period, in the, from in the late 18th and the first half of the 19th century, Germanization was expected. Um, they were supposed to be integrated. They were supposed to drop certain, not just Jewish communal self-government, that actually was ended in, in the 1780s in, in Austria, but the, um, uh, they were supposed to um, become part of the society in which they lived in a social sense, in a cultural sense, and then they could get emancipation right? if, as a reward. So it's still a quid pro quo, it's just the opposite way. Um, and um, of course it is more complicated because in Austria-Hungary, remember, was a big place. And in the Western, more Germanic parts of the empire, 
Jews had been highly restricted, but in the Eastern parts, they weren't as restricted, right? The Galicia, which had come from Poland, there the Jews had Polish rights, which gave them lots of economic rights um, and no political rights, of course, but still economic rights, and they still had those. Um, and in Hungary too, there was a, a, an unclear situation in certain parts, but, but the point is both of those areas, Galicia and, and, um, and Hungary had huge numbers of Hasidic Jews and not just traditional Jews, but uh, specifically Hasidic Jews. And they had no interest in modernization, but they nevertheless had, had emancipation. So we have a very complicated situation um, uh, in, in, in Austria, Hungary that we don't have in Germany or France for that matter, or in, for that matter, but we do have in, um, and I will just tell one funny story and then stop talking. But when the Emperor Franz Josef died in 1916, there were 20 Jewish delegates to his funeral in St. Stephen's Cathedral. Um, official, so there was the chief rabbi of Vienna, the chief rabbi of Prague, the, you know, people you would expect. And the Belzer Rebbe, and the Gera Rebbe, and other Hasidic Rebbe's who went to church, who went to church to the funeral of the Kaiser. So, um, you know, we have a different situation. They didn't mm -hmm. become German. <laughs> They probably understood not a word of what was being said, but they were at his funeral. Thank you, Marcia. I, you know, we all worked on this exhibition and we had a chance to walk through it um, for a little while before this program. And I'm wondering, you know, much of what you've relayed here, visitors will find in the exhibit. I'm wondering if, if people who are listening to this program want to go check out the exhibit, what should they look for? And, and what there do you think might surprise them? It could be particular books, but it could also just be particular issues or, or conversations that are happening in, in the collection. Well, I, 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 I think one thing that leaps out from the exhibit uh, is just how complex emancipation was <coughs> and how the, the legal issues were very intricate. Um, it, it, the process was never simple. Uh, and the debates uh, were sustained and very detailed because they're debates about legal standing, which involved the whole juridical structure of a country. Um, and I, I think the other thing that comes out is that um, Jews were, were sort of a um, paradigmatic group in the sense that decisions about the status of Jews in a, in a particular society were actually decisions about the nature of the society itself, not just about the Jews. So I think that that's what runs through the exhibit, um, though expressed in very intricate detail. Um, I think it's, uh, you know, in terms of picking up on the like surprising element, um, I mean, if you go through the exhibit, it begins with the British case, the British Empire, then moves on to France, then moves on to the Germanic states, uh, and then somehow ends up with Herzl. Um, <laughs> and, you know, we discussed this. We, you know, we said, like, you know, does this make sense that we would end, you know, with Herzl's, you know, the Jewish state and, uh, and some other documents related to Herzl? Um, I mean, you know, of course, you know, Herzl Zionism essentially presented itself, um, at least political Zionism presented itself as a kind of solution uh, to uh, an emancipation that had essentially failed. Um, and so, I mean, some of us were leery about kind of endorsing that kind of message. Um, but I think, you know, I mean, and, you know, David wrote, uh, a very interesting discussion, um, essay on, on Herzl within uh, the um, catalog for the exhibit. Um, but, you know, it's interesting to look at 
Herzl in the way, I mean, yes, he was critiquing emancipation, uh, but there were various aspects of emancipation uh, that he envisioned um, in like the Jewish state of the future. So, um, or Jewish homeland of the future. So uh, I think that is a little surprising, but you know, it's part of the exhibit. Could we talk a little bit about the periodization of emancipation versus emancipation as an ongoing process? I know David makes some arguments about this in his, um, in his work. Is there, is there a debate about this or can we all just <laughs> say? Well, well I, I think that for, um, for a long time, his, many historians would, would, have, would see emancipation as being historically discrete. You know, that it began, let's say, some historians would say either with the enlightenment in the 18th century, because the enlightenment uh, advocated uh, human e equality, or to begin it with the French Revolution, with its ideal of equality and the emancipation of Jews. Uh, and then some historians would see the process ending, as Marsha pointed out, around 1870, uh, with the unification of Italy, the unification of Germany, and the restructuring of the Habsburg Empire into the Austro-Hungarian monarchy, at which point Jews gained equality uh, as part of that, and, and as part of the triumph of liberalism and nationalism. Other historians, some historians would say, well, you can't quite stop there. You have to then go on um, to deal with the Jews of Eastern Europe, especially Russia, and then emancipation then ends in 1917 when the, in, during the first Russian revolution, the provisional government gives Jews equality and puts an end to the pale of settlement. Uh, so that that has been a kind of the, the sort of um, those are the parameters of what it ha have been the conventional chronology for emancipation. But <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I, I I think we one one could also argue, and I would certainly argue um, that emancipation actually begins earlier than the 18th century as in various parts of Western and Central Europe, uh, Eng England, as I discussed, is part of this. Um, Jews who are living with, with uh, legal privileges begin to gain parity with other groups. This occurs in some of the Italian city-states uh, in, the, in, in the 17th, in the um, 16th century, uh, it, it goes, the development sort of travels up the Atlantic seaboard uh, in Amsterdam when Jews begin, are admitted in the 1590s, primarily Sephardic Jews, um, as, and, and sort of as an as a, um, anticipation of what happens in England, uh, Jews aren't given privileges, but their status remains rather vague and ambiguous. Uh, what the city of Amsterdam had decided to do, or the city fathers, was not to give privileges to different merchant groups like Jews, but rather to introduce a uniform commercial law. And so Jews lived under that uniform commercial law alongside other groups. Uh, so those, so, so I would argue the process of emancipation begins earlier. And it also holds in Eastern Europe, uh, where Jews who are being invited into by Polish magnates into private market towns, what later come to be the, the Shtetlach or the Shtetl in Eastern Europe, are often given parity with Christian burghers in those towns and often even share the duties of burghers in those towns. So you begin to have a, a, a different status emerging. Um, similarly, I would argue emancipation doesn't end in 1917. Uh, it continues on in the interwar period uh, as Jews lose rights, their emancipation is being repudiated, right? And 
if you look at Nazi Germany or Italy, beginning with Mussolini's second revolution in 1938, Jews are being deprived of rights. But then, of course, after the Second World War, Jews regain rights. Um, and I think it's also important to see that issues such as um, uh, the restoration of property and reparations are also part of emancipation, of an ongoing emancipation. Mm -hmm. That that isn't a separate chapter of Jewish history to be subsumed under a category of the Holocaust and post-Holocaust. That's also part of the ongoing history of emancipation. Mm -hmm. uh, and I would also argue <laughs> that the civil rights movement in the United States is part of the second emancipation of American Jewry, that Jews were fighting for equality in terms of equal opportunity employment, fair housing, and end to the end to quotas at colleges, universities, and professional schools. I'm really glad that you brought us at least into the 20th century. I'm gonna push us into the 21st century with one more um, prompt, and then we'll start to take questions. Uh, you know, what are the key takeaways for today? Where are we seeing echoes of these conversations that are happening in the books of the Lapidus Collection and in this exhibit, um, you know, in today's world in terms of anti-Semitism, in terms of questions of dual loyalties? Uh, I think it's actually broader than just about the Jews. I mean, um, if you want to bring it into the contemporary scene. One of the things I think that the, the trying to understand Jewish emancipation makes us do is how does a society cope with, deal with uh, groups that are different than it? How does mm -hmm. it deal, how does a society deal with the other? And to what extent does it allow the other to become part of it on its own terms, you know, and, and to be itself, you know, mm -hmm. to, to not force you know, um, a certain straitjacket of behavior, but but not just tolerate, mm -hmm. but to accept difference. And that's a very important issue for uh, contemporary societies when we deal with people migrating from all over the world to societies that have been relatively homogeneous as in Europe and um, or in, in America where we haven't been homogeneous, but we also have a lot of, of immigrants who are different than mainstream Americans, and there's a backlash against it, and a very scary backlash against it, of which anti-Semitism is a part, but only a part. Um, it, it's you know there's there's much more, um, and I I think that paying attention to how we cope with difference and how people coped in the past mm -hmm. with Jewish difference, because Jews were the you know the emblematic, the paradigmatic other in Europe in the 19th century, and now there are other groups that have you know, sort of taken that place in many societies. And it really sensitizes us to these issues, I think. Thank you. I, I wanna just encourage those of you who are watching and listening on Zoom to submit questions for our panel that way um, through the chat um, and Zoom, and we can start to take those questions as well. What does citizenship mean today? Do we have to give anything up? Or what are the expect are there expectations of us as citizens? Uh, we have multiple identities. Yeah, I think it, it depends on it depends on the context. You know, I mean, um, you know, I guess I would say like you know today in the United States, you know, I. I mean, I, yes, there is something that's given up, but you know, I, I see citizenship as a more passive type of thing. I mean, um, you know, it's and more about um, you know certain kind of like liberal um, protections from the government, you know, limited government things like that. Uh, I mean, I'm just thinking about you know even after 9/11, you know, and, and then President George W. Bush was asked what Americans should do, and he said you should go out and go shopping. Um, yeah, I mean that that that's different from let's say a model in Israel where I mean citizenship is a very fraught issue mm -hmm. and involving obviously Jews and Arabs, but um, but at least among the Jewish population, you know there is a sense I think of a more like Republican type of model of citizenship where it's more active, you know, so like you know in terms of like a universal conscription uh, and things like that. So 
Well, I think citizenship varies. I think, you know, when we think of what it means today also, I mean, I, going beyond Jews, um, you know, just the general issue of statelessness. Um, I mean, you know, as a result, I mean, we know about all the, the immigration you know, issue in this country, but I mean, really, this is a, a worldwide phenomenon of people escaping uh, political violence at home um, or the beginnings of climate change and the effects it's already having and the effects it's projected to have. And so, you know, you have, you know, I think the population of refugees now is as large as it's been since probably World War II, um, maybe larger. Uh, and so, you know, what citizens, you know, what, what rights mean for people who are, you know, essentially stateless. I mean, I, you know, Hannah Arendt famously said, you know, that, uh, you know, that, um, the kind of critiqued uh, human rights, saying that basically people could only get, gain rights, um, you know, through a state, through actually acquiring citizenship. Um, and, you know, when you think of, you know, all these you know, stateless groups today, um, you see, and, and the kind of in, in, in efficacy of any type of uh, human rights regime to really kind of provide real protections. I think it just shows you, you know, what, how much citizenship is worth. Okay, so we can also, we can start by taking questions from this room. Yes. Um, just one second, we're gonna bring you a microphone so people on Zoom can hear you as well. Thank you. Having gone through the exhibit, at least three quarters of it, and listening to a lot of things that you that you stated, which is a little, it goes along with what was what I read. So much to cover. We're dealing with centuries of history. We're dealing with different countries and different rulers and different changes within those countries. So things change. Now you can just stay in, a, in one country and see how it morphs from one leader to the next, from one change of law to another, one degree of uh, tolerance or uh, we call it emancipation. And it's, it's such a vague term because emancipation from what I gathered and what was stated um, always came with conditions. Yes, we welcome you here. However, at each different country, at a different time, with a different uh, uh, ruler, is going to change things. And I'm coming close to a question. I wonder, for those people who were in limbo, um, within a certain period of time, naturally, except the time that they lived, obviously. I wonder if it was a conundrum for them, whether they had to make a very difficult decision where they preferred to go, knowing what the conditions are here, knowing what the conditions are there, what changes, you know, they might even convert. They got to become more German, they got to become more French, they got to become more English. Uh, considering how they have to, how they would have to adapt, depending on where they, were, where they would like to go, if they could go there, was that a very difficult decision for a lot of people to make at different times, at different places? It's a wonderful question. It's so big, though. I mean, where does one even start to, where does one even start to think about it? I think Jews coped with it in a variety of ways, in a variety of places. People are different, and they respond differently. So in Germany, for example, um, some Jews uh, created the reform movement because they thought they should change Judaism to conform to modern sensibilities. Um, other Jews created uh, modern orthodoxy because they didn't think, they thought Judaism should change, but not in the same way as the reformers thought it should change. Other Jews went to America. And, right, I mean, they, people respond in different ways. And so there are, it's not as a Jewish response. There are many Jewish responses. Um, some Jews assimilated thoroughly and even converted. Other Jews did not. Um, uh, you know, 
the traditional orthodoxy that had existed in the German states and in Alsace as well, um, that disappeared. But orthodoxy didn't disappear, right? And in Austria-Hungary, where Jews were emancipated, not only did um, <coughs> traditional, traditional orthodoxy may have, well, I don't know if it disappeared, but Hasidism didn't disappear. It got stronger and bigger. So um, there are many, and that was a response to modernity too. And, and Jews, I mean, the, the Austrian government required everybody to go to public school. Okay, that's nice. Did the Hasidim send their boys to public school? Of course not, right? Uh, they sent their girls, but not their boys. Well, but to go back to some of the one or two of the examples Marsha Marsha mentioned before, where in, in those German states where there were um, strict regulations about how many people could marry and where you had to wait your turn to marry, states like Bavaria um, and then Bohemia and Mora Moravia as well, um, those were states from which many young Jewish men emigrated mm -hmm. and women too and came to the United States. That, those were the states which provided uh, most of the, well, most of the immigration to the United States in the 19th century. If you look at where Jews from the German, from Central Europe came from, by and large, they were coming from states where Jews had the fewest rights. Okay, and, and the other thing that, and the other thing, and you know, this was true for the great migration of Russian, Russian, Galician, and Romanian Jews in the late 19th century. Um, Jews were moving from areas where they were not, well, in Galicia it was poverty. They had they rights. Had they, rights. They, had they, they, they had rights. They didn't have money. But they were poverty. But, but they, they suffered from, from poverty. But from Russia and Romania, Jews did not have rights. Jews were confined to the Pale of Settlement in Russia, uh, where, the, where after 1881, 1882, um, the economic conditions became ever increasingly um, uh, worse, uh, growing poverty, you know, and by the beginning of the 20th century, some 25 to 30 percent of Jews in the Pale of Settlement were receiving some kind of charity. Uh, so that, that that's those were the areas from which Jews migrated. So there, there did tend to be a, a direct correlation between rights and emigration. I'm going to ask. I'm going to paraphrase one question that we got online, which is really about. Um, um, I'll say it's a it's about military service and how does military how did how if at all did military service um, change or affect Jews' legal status if they served or if they didn't serve? Yeah. Well, I, um, well, maybe one way to talk about that is that Marsha and Dan both mentioned a quid pro quo, sort of a contract of emancipation of rights for duties, equal duty, equal rights for equal duties. And one of those equal duties was conscription. Uh, Jews serving in the armies of modern European states begins with Joseph II's act, act of universal conscription in 1787. Jews are conscripted during the French Revolution to serve in the French army. In many German states, Jews volunteer to fight in the so-called wars of liberation against Napoleon. And so conscription became one of those duties that was understood to be nece a necessary part of citizenship. Um, and it's, and I think one, one um, there's a very good book by Derek Pensler about Jews in the military in which he makes the point that as a result of those policies of conscription, in the 19th and 20th century, hundreds of thousands, indeed millions of Jewish men had military experience. Uh, and that it's, it's a mistake, for example, to argue that it only begins with the state of Israel, that Jews know how to defend themselves, um, know, know how to defend themselves and, have a mo and serve in a modern army. Jews have served in modern armies since 1787. 
Um, and of course, army, there were armies and armies, right? right? I mean, there were armies in which the situation of the Jews was horrific, like the Russian army. Jews were drafted into the Russian army as well. And, um, and of course, there in the middle of the 19th century, they were subjected to pressure to uh, convert to Christianity and, and so forth. That was not true later, but it was true in the middle of the 19th century. Um, the, um, the Austrian army, about which I know the most, was a, was a very nice army. You could even keep kosher in the army, mm -hmm. uh, in the Austrian army. Um, maybe not at the very front lines in the heat of battle, but, um, but you know, behind the lines normally, um, and, uh, and so forth. And, but, but armies were also both sites of discrimination against Jews as well as incorporation of Jews. So in the German army, it was very hard for Jewish men to, or the Prussian army particularly, it was very hard for Jewish men to get commissioned as officers. Um, and, but that was not the case at all in the Austrian army, where 17%, 17% of the uh, reserve officers, not the career officers, but the reserve officers were Jews, 17% in a country that was 4% Jewish. I mean, that's quite extraordinary, right? So, but armies are different. So you can't say, are armies good or bad, right? Because they're right. different. Uh, some are good and some right. are bad. But e even in the Russian army, um, there, there were periods in which there was press, pressure for conversion, but at the same time, yeah, th th there were, you know, th it was possible for Jewish soldiers uh, to maintain synagogues, um, 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 to keep kosher. Um, so, you know, it, it, it varied over time. It, Does anybody say that? Daniel, do you want to add anything to this? Or if not, I have People another question, which I'll. Oh. Um, well, I would just say, I mean, you know, during, you know, debates over uh, emancipation uh, or, um, you know, starting in the 18th century, one of the issues that, you know, arose specifically among opponents was the idea of Jewish military service, uh, the idea that Jews couldn't be good soldiers. Uh, and, you know, one reason was given that Jews are kind of, you know, congenitally weak and they have poor physiques and they don't have the vigor and, uh, that's necessary to be a good soldier, kind of a feminizing of the Jewish male. Uh, but I think, you know, another issue is a sense that a Jew will be more loyal to another Jew uh, where, wherever they live uh, than to, you know, um, to, than to kind of the state that they're a part of. Um, and you know, I mentioned this issue with Napoleon and the Jews before, but when Napoleon puts these um, very fraught questions uh, to this assembly of Jewish notables that he gathers, one of the questions basically forced them to say, um, you know, who do you feel closer to? Who do you feel more bound to? Uh, you know, a Jew who lives abroad uh, or to a, you know, a, to a Frenchman, uh, a non-Jewish Frenchman. Um, and so th th this issue was very, you know, um, it was a very live uh, and, uh, issue. Um, and what you see though, I mean, I think uh, and this has already been borne out, uh, but what happens over the course of the 19th century is that Jews do um, serve uh, in, you know, in great numbers in militaries on opposing sides in various wars. I mean, so, you know, in the Civil War in the United States, uh, the Franco-Prussian War in 1870, 1871, and then, I mean, most, um, you know, on, on the greatest scale in World War I. So... Um uh, we're going to take one, we're going to do one more question and, um, and then wrap it up. But I wanted to uh, ask whether, and I don't know how much any of you can, you know, want to speak to this, but how did struggles for uh, rights for Jews vary by gender? In three paragraphs or less. Well, <laughs> oh, well, in, in most European countries in the, in the 19th century, even into the 20th century, citizenship was a male affair. Um, citizenship attached to men. Women didn't, usually didn't have rights. Um, some, there are some exceptions, right? But, um, and, and, and of course you can see this with the franchise as well, right? You have universal male suffrage beginning in, in unified Germany in 1870, but women don't get the vote until the Weimar Republic. 
or in England, for example, the male suffrage becomes almost universal by the end of the 19th century. Women don't get the vote until after World War I. And when they do, it's only women 30 and older, right? Because that's the age in which women gain rationality. And in France, Noted. it was 1945. And Switzerland, 1966. Right. right. No, it's that's really. Um, and in America, of course, it was also after World that's War right. I. That's right. That's right. Women were certainly expected. I mean, there's still a good question, even though women had no political rights until um, the 20th century. <coughs> excuse me. Um, women weren't even allowed to be part of political organizations in most countries until at some point in the early 20th century, depending on where. Um, but um, but women were certainly expected to change, just like men were. Right? They were mm -hmm. certainly expected to become good French people, no, I didn't say French men, um, to become French, to become German, um, and so And to forth. raise their children as good. And to French. raise their children as good, and to, <laughs> and to raise their families, to make their families display, as Marion Cowan has so beautifully shown, um, to display both how German their families were and middle class, Ger middle class Germans, but also Jewish. You know, the Jewishness was very much a part of middle class German life. Um, in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. So women were included in the process of change. They were not expected to remain, uh, you, know, uh, you know, completely traditional. They weren't expected to stay speaking Yiddish when everyone else was German, right? Um, but they were French or whatever language. Um, but without the reward for doing so. <laughs> um, do you want to add anything? No, I, I mean, I just thought building on what uh, Marsha's saying, I mean, it's true. I mean, I mean, that women were expected uh, to assimilate, um, you know, but a lot of the research that has been done in terms of understanding, you know, how taking a, adopting a kind of gendered lens to the process of emancipation and assimilation, you know, work by Marion Kaplan, work by the late Paula Hyman has showed ways in which kind of women were um, kind of charged with taking on a more important kind of like religious role uh, in terms of serving as almost the kind of break on a process of assimilation, uh, lest it kind of go completely out of control. And so, you know, whereas formerly it was like, you know, let's say the patriarch was considered the guardian of religious values in the home, uh, that role began to um, devolve more to, 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 to mothers, to women. At the same time, as Benjamin Butter has shown, <laughs> we're all showing off right now. Um, as Benjamin Butter has shown, there was a feminization of Judaism. Yes. That is, everyone became passive in the synagogue and just sat there, you know, while the cantor did fancy things and, and the rabbi preached and so forth. So um, it's all complicated. On that cantorial note, so to speak, um, I want to thank you all for your participation, both with the um, the organization of the exhibition and with tonight's program, and thank the Center for Jewish History, and thank everyone who participated online, and encourage you all to come see our exhibit, which is up through February 28th.